This is CS1101, lecture 6.1. We're going to be discussing for loops. So this in general will be an introduction to the idea of looping, but we will focus first on for loops and then we will go to while loops later. This is just a quick reminder about the style expectations. So first of all, make sure that each line of code is less than 80 <coughs> um, characters this is enforceable at 100 characters so if you go over if you go over 100 characters in a single line then that will be uh, grounds for losing points there should be blank lines between methods uh, additionally there should be blank lines left between unrelated sections of code so if if the functional if there's a functional division between two groups of statements, there should also be a visual division between two groups of statements. You should leave blank lines. Um, capitalization in identifiers. Class constants should use all capital letters with uh, a multi-word name being uh, spaced out using underscores. So, you know, big hat for whatever reason, if that was going to be a constant, that would be a terrible constant name in general, but that would be capital B-I-G underscore H-A-T, all capital letters. Classes begin with uppercase, but then proceed with lowercase. You use camel case to identify uh, multi-word situations, so big hat would be capital B, lowercase I-G, capital H, lowercase H-A-T. So big hat with the B and the H capitalized. Variable and method names are also camel case. However, those begin with lowercase letters. Global variables shouldn't exist in your programs. The only thing that's global or is acceptable to be global in a program in this class is uh, constants. Finally, indentation. Your indentation should uh, match what would be generated by the auto format using IntelliJ. Um, in general, indentation should always follow scope. So if you if you have a uh, narrowing scope, so you at first make a class in Java, then <clears throat> you would populate that class with um, constants or methods. Those should be indented um, in from the class starting point. Then anything inside a method should be indented in from the method's indentation. So a common thing to have to do in both life and programming is repeat a set of actions or a set of, in Java, we call actions statements. So <clears throat> what would this look like day to day in your life or uh, in this particular case, a barista's life? Well, maybe something like this. Ask customer what kind of coffee they want get their coffee, take their money, tell them have a coffee-licious day, and hope and pray for a new job where I don't have to say coffee-licious. And when the next customer comes in, you are going to do this just again, <laughs> and again, and again, and again. And so you're going you're gonna to wind up just looping through this set of actions until the end of your shift occurs, and at that point, you have end loop. So sort of a pseudo-code representation of that, you could say, while my shift is not over, we're going to loop through this. And then once the shift is over, you get to hop out and go hang out at Prince House. So this is sort of a pseudo-code, you know, barista loop here. <clears throat> but this idea of looping is something that is very common in day-to-day, -day, you know, dishwashing. While the sink is full of dishes, pick up dish, clean food off, dry. Pick up dish, clean food off, dry. You see, <clears throat> this idea of needing to repeat a set of actions until a condition is met is intrinsic to uh, a lot of our experience in life. And it's also intrinsic to a lot of the things that we need to accomplish in programming. So this idea of needing to repeat statements and repeat actions in, in a programming language or in a programming environment, we would call that looping. So the statement or potentially group of statements that you need to repeat over and over again 
is called the body of the loop. And then there's always, there's always some way of getting out of the loop. There's always something that you test to see, do I need to do another loop? Or do I need to stop looping and move on with the program? And this is the test condition. Now, if you remember, we also had test conditions when we were dealing with if statements. Ifs are not loops. Ifs are conditional flow. Looping is different than an if statement, but both involve test conditions to decide whether or not you should take a particular path. So consider a situation where we need to print out, say, the first however many squares. We'll, we'll say the first hundred squares. So one times one, two times two, three times three, all the way up to 100 times 100. Well, we could go about it in the way that we have started here, where we independently code each statement, one statement for each square. So we're going to have to write 100 lines of code to produce 100 squares. Well, that's about 100 times redundant. Because it shouldn't be that we need a line of code for each of these squares that we wish to produce. In Java, or in any programming language really, that has a for loop, uh, for loop structure, <clears throat> it's a good application for such a situation. So this would encode in Java look something like this. So we would have the keyword for to indicate, hey, we're going to use a for loop. Then inside the declaration of this for loop, we are going to declare a variable called i which will be our counter. This is going to keep track of, of how many times we have looped through this uh, set of statements. Then we have the test. i is less than or equal to 6. So <clears throat> what's happening here is as long as this statement is true we will do another loop. And then finally we have the update condition. So at the end of each loop we will execute this line of code which updates the value which is uh, in the variable i. So <clears throat> once more this is our declaration for a for loop. We have the keyword for, we have the counter initialization so we can declare a variable in the initialization and initialize it to a value. This only happens once at the beginning of the loop. We have our test to decide if we need to continue to loop or if we're done. If the test is true, then we need to continue to loop. And we have our update. So at the end of the loop, we will execute this statement and it will affect our counter and as this happens, eventually our test should change in such a way that it eventually becomes so that we no longer want to continue in our loop. So we have our initialization, test, and update. And that is the structure for a for loop in Java always. So for parentheses, initialization, test, update. So now let's look at what's happening inside the body of this loop now that we've discussed the declaration of it. We have a system.out print line statement, which is going to print i, so whatever the current value of i is for the loop, and we're combining that, we're concatenating that with the string squared equals, and then we concatenate i times i. So we print the number squared equals, and then whatever the square is. So if you think about how this is going to operate based on what I've told you, this is the initialization, so i is set, equal, set to 1. We perform our test. i is less than or equal to 6. Yes, that's true. So then we go down here, and we execute this, which will print out 1 squared equals 1. Then we've hit the last statement in the loop. So at this point, our update occurs. So we have i equals i plus 1, so we just increment i to 2. Now, we will perform our test again. Is 2 less than or equal to 6? Yes. So we begin the test again. Or so then we begin the loop body again. 
2 squared equals 4. We've hit the end of the loop. At the end of the loop, we always go back and do the update. So now, i equals 2 plus 1 is 3. So now we are back at the beginning of the loop. Is 3 less than or equal to 6? Yes. So then we begin to do the statements inside the loop. I think you get the pattern. So the syntax for a for loop, one more time, we have the keyword for, followed by the rest of the declaration for the for loop, which is the initialization statement, the test statement, and the update. So the initialization is only done once at the very beginning of the loop. The test happens at the beginning of every loop, while the update occurs at the end of every loop. So we have declared the for loop in the first statement, the first line. This is the header or the declaration. And then the body is all the statements which you wish to repeat. And we put these inside of the curly braces which follow our for loop declaration or the for loop header. I use you, I'm using for loop declaration and for loop header interchangeably. So once the for loop test becomes false for whatever reason, we will not execute the statements inside the for loop. Instead, we will, the program pointer will jump to the next statement immediately below the ending curly brace for the for loop. So the first statement inside of the for loop de declaration or the for loop header is the initialization. So this indicates what variable to use in the loop and what the initial value should be. Now I'm not saying that this is the only variable allowed to be used in the loop, but it is the variable that Java will use to keep track of how many loops it's gone through, which variable should be updated, and which variable should be tested to see if we should continue the for loop. So this is commonly called the counter because of what I just said. Typically we consider this to be a count of how many times this has occurred. Also you could, uh, some refer to it as a loop induction variable. Think of it as a loop counter. That's the best way to conceptualize this. The initialization is only going to be performed at the beginning of the first loop, and it only happens once. And I, So that's been said several times. Hopefully that's ground in now. Um, you can use any variable name, not just I. You could call it index. You know, anything that would be appropriate um, to, to give meaning to what you're going to use it for. So you could call it counter, you could call it index, you could call it um, num of loops, you know. Uh, proper variable naming here should be used, so starting with lowercase and then continuing with camel case from that point. And you can start at any value, not just one. The variable type can also be any type, not just int, but int and char are the most common used. Next, we'll talk about the loop test condition. At the beginning of each loop, we have to test to see if we need to continue looping or if we are done and need to uh, skip to the next statement below the curly braces. The loop test condition, as I've said, is performed every time through the loop, so every iteration. The body executes as long as this test is true. If it's false, we skip to the statement after the loop. So this is a Boolean, it should re result in a Boolean value because it has to be true. If it's false, it's going to exit and go to the next statement. So whatever statement you write here, whatever expression you use here, must evaluate to a Boolean value. So typically you will use comparison operators, though not necessarily always. As long as this statement results in a Boolean value, then the test condition will be considered valid and will work. Um, but typically what you see is something like this. You know, we what we're doing here is we are going to do this loop um, for the values one through six inclusively because it's less than or equal to six. So we start at one and we do one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, so we have basically coded that we want to do the contents of this loop six times. So this is a common way to go about this because it's easily understood what you're attempting to do. The update is what happens after all the statements are completed inside of the loop body, but before you do the loop again. So this is a good way to increment or take some post action on every loop. So you can update by using any expression that you choose to write. 
So we could do some very convoluted things such as i equals i times 3 plus 2. Um, there are reasons that someone may choose to do that. For instance, if this code right here, um, let's say that you have some oddly spaced elements in an array and you want to access every third plus two element. I could see that being a situation, but there would be better ways to go about that, I think, and better ways to code it that would be more um, transparent and readable. So I would caution away from writing convoluted <coughs> update statements unless necessary. Usually we would just update the counter by uh, using an increment operator. So either i equals one plus i or you know plus plus i or i plus plus, any of these would work. However, typically the unary pre-increment operator is preferred. Um, because this is slightly more efficient than say doing i plus plus or i equals i plus one. So the update is done at the end of every loop, but the end occurs immediately before checking the test condition again. So this can be understood to uh, an operation which is done immediately before testing. Be careful about this because if you were to incorrectly code this, or you say the wrong variable, or let's say that you forgot to say i equals i plus one, and instead you just said i equals one, Java is going to let you do that. They, it is not going to, uh, it is not going to throw a compile error, and it will not throw a runtime error. What will happen is you will have uh, functional errors. So you will wind up in an infinite loop if you are not careful about how you handle your update statement. The same thing can be said of how you handle the test statement. If the test statement is incorrectly coded and for some reason always yields in a true, then you can you will wind up in an infinite loop. If it always yields in a false, then you'll never enter the loop to begin with. So one last time, let's look at exactly how this loop will execute. So our program pointer lands on the declaration for the for loop. So we are entering this top box and remember so rectangles are actions while uh, diamonds are tests. So this would be a decision while this is just an action. So first of all, we have our initialization happens first, right? So this is a function block diagram of this execution for the, for the loop. So first of all, perform the initialization. So i equals 1. Now, at the beginning of every loop, we will test to see if we need to continue looping. Is one less than or equal to four? Yes. Okay, now we execute all the statements in the loop. One squared equals one. And we print that out. Then we perform the update. I equals I plus one. I is now equal to two. We go back to the test. Is the test true now? Two less than or equal to four? Yes. Now we're going to print out two squared equals four. We will now perform the update again. I is now three. Is three less than four or equal to four? Yes. Three squared equals nine. Update. I is now four. Is Four less than or equal to four? Yes. Four squared equals 16. I is now equal to five. Is five less than or equal to four? No. And now we have jumped from the test because it was false to the statement following the end of the for loop. In this case, it prints out the statement woot. And so we see woot. Let's see if we can predict what the output will be from this from this loop. Our program pointer lands on the for loop declaration. We initialize a variable called i to the value 1. And we test to see if uh, we should loop at this point. Well, yes, i is 1, and 1 is less than or equal to 3, so we do the contents of the loop. We print out, hey, hey, let's go. So that's the first output we're gonna have. Hey, hey, let's go. 
we hit the end of the for loop, <clears throat> at which point we are going to do a unary pre-increment on i. So an i is now equal to 2. Now that we have uh, done the post action, the update, we have to go back and test. Is 2 less than or equal to 3? Yes. So we print out, hey, hey, let's go. We hit the end of the loop again. We're going to increment to 3 and then test. Is, is 3 less than or equal to 3? Yes. Now that we've done the actions, we go back and we increment again. 4. Is 4 less than or equal to 3? No. So at this point, we will exit the for loop, go to the next statement, which prints out, let's go beat those volunteers. And so we have repeated the hey, hey, let's go three times. And now we have uh, added that tagline, let's go beat the volunteers. This for loop is a very common one to see, and it's one of the more easy ones to read because i equals 1, we're starting from the value 1. Our test is going to be uh, less than or, e or equal to 3, so inclusive of 3, and we're incrementing i uh, one at a time. So for each number 1 to 3, do this action. So we're going to do whatever's in the loop three times, which is why our comment here is repeat three times. In general, this would be a fairly poor comment to put on a loop because it's a mechanical comment. It's describing, it's describing how loops work. A good programmer doesn't need to be told how loops work. They know that. They need to be told what the functional purpose of this set of code is. But right now, this is to help you understand that we should be able to read this and know that this loop occurs three times. So when we were making if statements to be able to control program flow, we didn't just have a single statement inside of our if. We would have multiple. And we've mentioned that already, that you can have multiple statements inside of, inside of a loop. That's what the curly braces are for. So each time the loop executes, all of the statements inside the curly braces will be executed. It is also true that if you have only one statement for the inside the for loop, you do not have to use curly braces. If you remember, that was also true in if statements. If you had a single statement, uh, which would be the result of the if statement being true, you didn't have to use curly braces. But we also talked about at length that not using curly braces was a bad decision because it would create uh, reading difficulty in the code and it would make your code less transparent so we said never do that always use curly braces the same thing is true here we expect you to always use curly braces um, when you're writing for loops otherwise your code becomes less readable so this code prints out sort of an edged ribbon design we to read and understand how this code works we understand that we execute statements top down. So we begin by printing out uh, this set of characters, uh, which is in this string. We see that here. Then we have a for loop, which starts at one. It goes to three, inclusive of three. And we're incrementing in steps of one. So this will go i equals one, i equals two, i equals three, then we'll exit the loop. And each loop will print out a forward slash followed by a, or a backslash followed by a forward slash with space in between. Remember, this is an escape sequence to represent a uh, backslash because backslashes are used to designate escape sequences. Um, and then on the next line, we'll print out forward slash followed by backslash. So this creates some, a, a sort of jagged edge so it's that's why I'm calling it a uh, jagged edge ribbon so we'll print this uh, two line output three times so here's one time two times three times and then finally we're gonna print the uh, 
set of characters again that we printed at the beginning. So here again, um, our code that we wrote to print out the squares, we could have omitted the curly braces. Don't omit the curly braces. Always use the curly braces. This code would not work correctly because only the, fo only the uh, one statement following the for loop would be executed in a looping fashion. This would be considered outside the for loop. Indentation doesn't matter in Java. What matters in Java is uh, what's inside a curly brace. So the fact that you are allowed to omit curly braces in a few specific situations makes things ambiguous. Don't omit curly braces. So these, these uh, statements which we use for initialization, testing, and update can be simple literals. So it could be like we've seen previously where we say int i equals one or we could write an expression. Technically, a literal is an expression, but um, we can make a more complex expression and use it in each of these statements if we so chose. So in this situation, we would have int i equals base value minus 472, so i equals 3. The test is, is i less than or equal to base value divided by 2? And the update is, 2 times i. So we are going to double the value of i each loop. So when this loop executes, i is equal to 3. Is 3 less than or equal to 237? Yes. So therefore, we will print out 3 plus 132, 135. We've hit the end of the loop time to update. i equals 2 times i. So 3 becomes 6. Is 6 less than 237? Yes. Then we are going to print 6 plus 132, 138. So then we will update again. 6 becomes 12. Is 12 less than 237? Yes. 12 plus 132, 144. Now we are going to go back and update again. 12 becomes 24. 24 is still less than 237. So we will print out 24 plus 132, which is 156. So our update will then make 24 into 48. 48 is still less than 237. So we add 48 to 132 to get 180. We update. 48 becomes 96. 96 is still less than 237, so we print out 132 plus 96, which is 228. Then uh, we will double 96 to 192. Is 192 less than 237? Yes, it is. So for that reason, we will end up printing out uh, our final number here because when we when we double that 196 doubled will be greater than 237 so at that point the loop terminates and we move to the statement which follows so keep in mind we've not said that we have to take this approach where we increment until we hit the test condition and it becomes false we said that we must have a test condition and we must have an update so the update could have been a decrement and we could have been testing to see if we were still larger than or greater than some value. So in the situation where we wish to uh, have a decrementing loop counter, then we need to use greater than or greater than or equal to rather than less than or less than or equal to. So let's look at the execution of this loop. We print T minus and now we're counting down. So for loop declaration, we initialize i to 10, so i equals 10. Is 10 greater than or equal to 1? Yes. So we will do what is inside the loop. We are going to print out i followed by a comma. So t minus 10 comma, end of the loop, time to update. So minus minus i is the unary pre-decrement operator. So i becomes 9. 
is nine less or is nine greater than or equal to one? Yes, it is. So we print out I followed by a comma. So nine. Hopefully you're picking up on it. So now we hit the end of the loop. We are going to do the update. Nine becomes eight. Is eight greater than or equal to one? Yes. Eight comma. Update. Eight becomes seven. Is seven greater than or equal to one? Yes. Print out seven comma. Update. Seven becomes six. So I is not equal to six. Is I greater than or equal to one? Yes. So print out six comma. Five comma, four comma, three comma, two, one. So then when we get to one, is one greater than or equal to one? Yes. So we print out one comma, and then we get to the end of the loop and we decrement. So I becomes zero. Is zero greater than or equal to one? No. So we jump to the so we jump to the statement which immediately follows the for loop, which prints out blast off. So this was sort of a uh, space shuttle blast off little um, printout is what was going on here. So this, you know, what, what you might have heard if you had been there for SpaceX's um, uh, Crew Dragon launch. Sometimes the way that a loop is coded will mean that it does not execute at all. We refer to this as a degenerate loop. So, if a loop executes zero times, that means that the statements inside the loop will not execute at all. An example of this would be if we initialized i to be 10, so we inside our for loop decla declaration we have i equals 10, but then our test is, is i less than 5? The answer is no on the very first loop attempt. So we will jump to the statements immediately following the for loop curly braces. So this will, the, uh, the printout, how many times do I print, never occurs. It will never be printed to the console. The opposite problem can exist. So some loops may execute forever because the way that they're executed means that um, there's no way for the loop to terminate. This is called an infinite loop. <clears throat> Infinite loops almost always mean that an error was made in coding. So, if I were to code the following lines, we would never terminate the loop. So in the declaration, initialize i to 1. Is i less than or equal to 10? Yes. Print out help, runaway Java program. As soon as, that, as, soon as the statements inside the for loop body are complete, we do the update i equals i plus plus. So we talked about this early on, but the way that this is going to execute is we are going to assign the value one to the variable i because this is a post increment. So this is, a, this is an assignment to a unary post increment. So what happens is because of the precedence of the operators, we always execute the right hand statement first. So we will, we will provide the value one as the value for this expression, then increment the value i. So i gives the value 1 to the right-hand side expression and then increments to 2. But then the assignment operator assigns the value 1 into i. So the value of i goes from being 1 to being 2, then back to 1. This is a common mistake but nonetheless a mistake and so what happens is i is left unchanged that's why you have to really think about when to use the post increment or the pre increment unary operators so this will leave i unchanged is one still less than or equal to 10 yes print out help runaway java program update oh leaves it unchanged so i is still one is one still less than or equal to 10 yeah it's going to be less than or equal to 10 for all eternity so um, we're gonna keep printing out help want runaway Java program until this computer dies or uh, catches fire from exhaustion so quick comp comprehension check what will this loop print out we have a variable declared which is called sum it's an integer and we have assigned it the value 0 and we've also declared another integer called number but we've not given it a value so we've not initialized it so then we have a for loop declaration 
and we have three statements the initialization the test and the update in the initialization we give the variable number a value of one then in the test we see if number is less than or equal to four so is one less than or equal to four yes it is we do the contents um, of the for loop which is called the body so we do the statements which are in the body of the for loop and we say sum equals sum plus number so this will mean that sum becomes one then we do the update because we've reached the end of the for loop statements so plus plus number so we're gonna do a unary pre-increment on number number becomes two is two less than or equal to four yes it is so one or so sum equals one plus number number is two sum becomes three time to do the update so plus plus number number becomes three is three less than or equal to four yes it is so we now have three plus three is sum so we now have the value six in sum and then we update number again four is four less than or equal to four yes it is um, six plus four is ten then we do the update plus plus number is going to result in number having the value five is five less than or equal to four no it's not we jump down we print out the value sum sum prints out ten or does it so in the examples we've seen up to this point our curly brace followed the for loop but here we've got a semicolon after the for loop well in Java we do put semicolons after stuff I don't know is it a problem yep it's a problem notice because we put this semicolon at the end of our for loop statement instead of following it by curly braces as we should have and then providing the statements inside the curly braces which e with each of those statements terminated in a semicolon what happened was we declared a for loop which had no body we had a header or a declaration but no body perfectly okay Java accepted that no problem and so because of this we had no statements inside the for loop so what Java did was it did exactly what a for loop does it did all the statements in the for loop four times right because we're going one to four inclusive of four but there were no statements inside the for loop so what did it do four times nothing <laughs> it would test oh there's no statements update test update test update test update until it got the four and then it quit and it went on to the statements which followed the for loop and so the result is that number took on the value five sum was never changed and so we had sum equals zero plus five so sum takes on the value five and we print out the value five you have to be careful about syntax this is a syntax error that Java won't say anything about because this is still valid syntax Java can't tell what you want to happen it can just tell whether or not what you typed in is valid code this is valid code it's just not code that does what you want it to do be careful when you're dealing with for loops and also consider this a reminder about conditional statements as well or decision statements anytime you have variables which are declared inside of a curly brace they die at the end of that curly brace section so if you declare a variable inside of a for loop body then that variable does not exist outside of the for loop body if you declare a variable inside of a group of statements in, uh, in an if statement so surrounded by curly braces following an if statement then that variable dies after you leave those curly braces so if you want to use a variable inside of a for loop and outside of a for loop you have to make sure that you declare the variable outside of the for loop body so let's look at that so first of all we have a public static void function not going to return anything called example and we declare a variable called X and we give it the value 3 and then we declare our for loop and we are creating a variable called I 
and we give it the initial value of 1. Then we say i is less than or equal to 10 for the test. Yes, that's true, so we're going to do the statements and we're going to do a pre-increment on i at, as the update. So functionally we understand what this is going to do is this should um, print the number which is stored in x out 10 times. After it's printed it out 10 times we will find that the test is now false. It will jump to the statement immediately following the for loop. This will attempt to print out the value of i. Well that should be readily doable. Wrong. We declared i inside of the for loop header which is part of the for loop. So therefore as soon as we hit this second curly brace and we exit back out into the um, rest of the method, i no longer exists. It is removed from memory and is no longer accessible. So therefore we will get a compiler error saying, I don't know what you're talking about. There is no variable i here. So look at the following code segment based on what we've just talked about and see if you can understand what is wrong with the uh, code. What, what sort of problems might exist here. So we have a simple for loop. We can tell from the header that we're going to start at 1 and go through 50 inclusive and we're going to be counting by 1. So I will take on the values 1 through 50. So we are going to do the contents of this loop 50 times. We have a test to see if I is even. If it is, then we will increment even sum. Else, we increment odd sum. And then afterwards, we are going to print out even sum and odd sum. What do you think? Anything wrong with it? Yep, definitely something wrong with it. So, even sum and odd sum only exist inside of, actually it's not even true that they only exist inside of the for loop. Worse than that, they only exist inside of the if statement. So as soon as you leave the if statement and enter into the rest of this for loop body, those are no longer in existence. So they're definitely not in existence when we get out here back to the um, rest of the method. So we declared these variables inside of the scope of an if statement and inside of the scope of a for loop. So definitely when we get back to the method scope, these variables have been destroyed. Code that would perform this same function properly would look like this. Declaration and initialization above the for loop, so this exists in the method scope. So the scope of these variables is the method entirely. Then inside of this for loop, we have declared some variable i. So i only exists inside the for loop. And we are going to do uh, the for loop 50 times for the reasons we discussed on the previous slide, because we're going to count from 1 to 50. And we are going to see if each of the values of i is even or odd. If it is even, we will sum uh, the value with the previous even sum. If it's odd, we'll sum it with the previous odd sum. So we're summing up all the odd numbers and summing up all the even numbers from 1 to 50. And then we print out the sum of the even and the sum of the odd. This code will work just fine because we've correctly scoped the variables. These variables are at the method scope. i is in the for loop scope. And we don't use i, we don't attempt to access i outside of the for loop, therefore it's fine for i to be in the for loop scope. The, the variables that we do attempt to access, even sum and odd sum, outside of the for loop, we have declared in the method scope. In general, make sure that when you declare a variable, you have thought about where you intend to use it, and if it is going to exist in the scope in which you intend to use it. If you remember back to when we talked about if statements and conditional statements, one and the same, two names for the same thing, <clears throat> we said that if you used a conditional statement to decide what to return in a method, you had to make sure that all possible 
paths through the conditional statement return to value. Otherwise, the compiler would throw an error saying not all paths return a value. And it doesn't do this in such a way that it accounts for logical completeness. So, you know, if you had uh, an if statement that was if the number is odd, return this value, and else if the number is even, return this value, Java is still going to say, well, not all program paths return a value, because what, what about the situation where both those tests fail? You say to yourself, there's no way for both those tests to fail. Yeah, but Java doesn't care about that. All it sees is that there's technically a possibility where all tests fail and you didn't account for that. So, very similar to this, Java is not going to care about the logical completeness of your code. It's going to care about a program path existence in which all tests fail. So the code that is shown here will throw an error because we are attempting to return a value from inside of a for loop. Java is going to say, yeah, that's fantastic, but what if this test fails and you never execute the contents of the for loop? You jump down here, no value is returned. So in this way, <clears throat> in this way, there is a program path that exists which returns no value, and that's not acceptable to the compiler. As a sort of sidebar, Notice that this loop defined here is not a true counter loop because even though it seems that we are going from zero to the length of s counting by one, so uh, zero to s exclusive, so zero to s minus one, length of s minus one, even though it seems like a counter loop, notice that when it occurs that we find the value c at that index location in the string we exit the loop immediately with and, and return the value i. So we are going to stop as soon as we find the value c. So even though this looks like a counter, like it do something for a certain number of times, it's not. This is actually what we would call an event loop. There's two kinds of loops, counter loops, which is do something so many times and then stop, and event loops, which is do something until a certain event occurs. This would actually be an event loop, and we'll talk about that in general later, Typically, we would use a while loop when coding event style loops. So now to correct our code from the previous slide where we failed to return a value um, in all program paths. All we would have to do is outside of the for loop return a value um, of negative one or some other value which would mean that uh, we did not find C in any location. Now in this way, when we find C, we can return the index of C, or if the string's length is zero, which means there is nothing in the string, we will not execute this for loop at all. We will jump to the, immediate, the statement immediately after the for loop, and we will return the value of negative one, which would be a way to indicate that we didn't find the value C here, either because the string was empty or because C did not exist. The point from this example, always make sure that if you are returning a value inside of a for loop or any other loop, that you account for the possibility where the loop doesn't execute at all. Otherwise, the compiler is going to throw an error saying not all program paths return a value.